It says it's live on my screen. Isn't actually showing up. The page. It must be yes, because somebody is like uh, it's like. Is it showing up? Seems so. Yep, there we go. I'm on the delay because that's what I was saying about thirty seconds. <laughs> I just want to tweet. I think we should be good to go. And uh, tweeted and whatnoted. So hopefully people will turn up and find us. Uh, so hello and welcome everybody to our very first fireside chat. Uh, so just be warned that it might be a bit clunky and odd because we're trying to figure out how to do this. Um, but um, so my name is Thomas uh, and I'm joined by my colleague Lauren um, and we're from the Center for Spacefaring Civilization. Uh, hopefully you've heard of us, uh, but if not, uh, we're a space law and policy think tank uh, focused on, well, space law and policy stuff. Um, and so today we're going to talk about sort of a bunch of kind of things because sort of we have these conversations all the time and we're like, well, you know, people might be interested in hearing what we patter on about. Uh, so we're going to talk about a different, couple of different things today um, and just sort of, uh, sort of see where we go. Um, on, I think, what was the title of this? A, a new normal in space governance. Um, and so borrowing the phrase that is on everyone's lips at the moment, um, sort of like, what does that mean? Uh, fortunately, we're not going to be talking about COVID all that much. Um, when we say a new normal, we mean everything else that's going on in the chaos that is the world uh, these days um, beyond coronavirus. So, you know, are, are we in a new Cold War or, you know, um, well, everything that and all the things that it may or may not mean, and all the, the chaos and depression that <laughs> may not be. Doing. What does it mean for outer space? Um, so I don't know if, if Lauren has anything to add to that little ramble. Yeah, well, for me also, I can say that it's uh, it's hopefully about modernizing space governance. So um, yesterday we posted about the hundred years of women's suffrage in the United States. And so I think that gender parity is something that will need to be explored for space governance now and in the future, uh, as well as things like the safety, secure and sustainable use of outer space and celestial bodies. So there's a lot of buzzwords floating around that we can kind of discuss a little bit because some of them are mostly accurate when they are discussed. And sometimes I find them to be a little less likely to be the way forward. So we can have a talk about this and what that means for the new, the, I guess the next 2020 global order and what that means for space as well. Absolutely, and I think the definitions bit, I mean, that's, that's sort of mainly what we want to talk about today, really. And that's, that's something we often go back and forth on a lot. And I think it's, it's one of the things that comes across, you know, in our sort of quasi interdisciplinary uh, approach of realizing that, you know, coming from being more grounded in international law, whereas you're more grounded in international relations, we often use the same word, but actually mean different things. Um, and, you know, so I think like I, a good one to start with is sort of space governance and well, what, what does that mean? And, and it's a phrase that I've started to use quite a lot more over the last say 18 months, um, not least of which because it's now actually in my job title uh, as a lecturer in space governance. Um, 
But I think it's it's important to recognize that there's there's more to this than just the Outer Space Treaty. Um, the, 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 the framework, the guides, how we conduct our activities in outer space now and in the future, you know, isn't just law and certainly not just black letter law. Um, you know, the, I know, I know you can get annoyed by the phrase soft law and maybe we can talk about that a bit later, but it's things like soft law, which are non-binding norms. Um, and, you know, but you've also got political considerations as to, you know, and, and that can, you know, that infects the law too, because how we choose to interpret certain words uh, in in the treaty can can be influenced by politics. Um, I know I've been in several discussions where we discuss whether the phrase exploitation is negative, um, because, you know, or do we exploit space resources? Um, and it's like, well, I'm, uh, you know, and trying to explain to people that, well, it, it's certainly in certain versions of English or in certain political persuasions within the Anglophone world, exploitation is seen as a really bad thing. Um, and we need, so we need to take that into consideration. Um, and so we try to, uh, at least I try to use space governance as a, a more broader catch-all term, but recognize that there's, there's more to it than just, what does the Outer Space Treaty say? Um, and I think you probably agree with that. Yeah, and I can add also from my research in the governance of low Earth orbit that I have a, a good working knowledge of regime theory from international relations. And I believe that governance as it stands today is a continuation of regime theory from a theoretical perspective. So actually we're talking about how a whole system operates. It includes you know, states and non-state actors, which I think is a critical component often overlooked for various reasons, um, especially in space, that's going to mean our private or commercial sector. Um, so I, I look at space governance as kind of showing everything there is to show about the political, the legal, the policy, um, the, the decision makers, the actors, stakeholders, whatever you want to call them, and all of that together and how that works. And I think it's unique now because we've got a, a, be a better understanding of how a regime works and what a regime has to go through to avoid decay. And I could argue that the outer space regime uh, as a whole is um, based on the tenets of the outer space treaty and the four core treaties themselves, as well as um, an understanding that there are actors coming in almost on a, on a daily or monthly basis because of how approachable space is now uh, from a scientific and technical perspective. And especially that we have um, kind of built a niche regime but we're not so unique in that you haven't seen it before i know you've looked at you know the there's the maritime regime the aviation regime etc and so that's where i see that the space regime is kind of its own with its own you know laws and policies and and non-binding international law but at the same time it it has overlaps with especially the international telecommunications union and like the the telecom or radio regime. And so I look at it as space governance for me is the outer space regime with sub regimes such as, you know, low earth orbit or geo or the, um, the moon or going to Mars, but also that it's a complex and it's connected to these other regimes by uh, various different aspects. Another one that we're connected to would be disarmament or the, the newer um, cybersecurity regime. So I think that it's time to start looking not just at space by itself all the time, but as an interconnected, you know, part of this bigger web of regimes and, and political interests. Because like you said, one issue in space is not just the decision makers aren't thinking of it as just space alone. They're looking at it as the whole of their sovereignty and the whole of their power and the whole of their security. So space is unique, but it's not by itself any longer. And I think the picking up on like and the need for perhaps a slightly differentiated regime, depending on where we're talking about in space, is, is important. And I think it, it does seem to be getting a growing recognition. Um, and that can be a practical uh, that, you know, I mean, Earth, Earth orbit is obviously the most important bit, specifically economically and militarily uh, right now, because that's where the vast majority of space activity happens. Um, but you've also got like physical considerations in the fact that, you know, operating on an asteroid or operating on a, a, a planet are going to be very different, they're very different environments. And so what you need may differ quite a bit. I remember, you know, being involved in the Hague working group uh, process, that was something that sort of came up. I was like, well, 
how far dust travels on this you know 20 kilogram asteroid is going to be different from how far dust travels on the surface of mars and therefore you know the actual specific regulations that you need to avoid harmfully interfering with somebody else's operation may need to be different just because physics that you know the like the physics of dust traveling and what have you works differently um and like well, yeah that's that's an important point and you don't get that uh, on 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 other bits i mean the awake from a ship in you know the pacific is the same as a wake from a ship in the atlantic so you don't need to worry about like oh do, do the do waves behave differently on different parts of the planet um i'm sure there's probably some hydro uh, some physicists or whatever you'll say well actually because of the way <laughs> the, 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 depending where you are in the equator um but you know take the meaning um and then but i also think there's 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 also like other considerations I mean, in my background looking into the asteroid mining of especially the smaller asteroids because they didn't have the internal heating, um, you'll have a, a different distribution of the minerals in them. And so in order to get at what you want, you may need to physically dismantle the asteroid. Whereas say on Mars, you might be able to do more traditional mining. Um, so again, needs for different regulations, needs for different property rights and, and, and things. And then there's considerations of how long it takes to get there. And we, and we did that, talked about that in our disaster webinar not too long ago. Of like, well, the, when it comes to Mars, you're some of the things you can do are limited by the fact that it's going to take 20 minutes just to get a message back to mission control. I would definitely agree from an IR perspective. That's why I'm heavily under the influence of what's called uh, an evolutionary regime. And the best example is when the, the GATT became the World Trade Organization, the WTO. So the trade regime is the, the like, I guess, prime example of an evolving regime. And I think that we are in that same boat yet in a slightly different manner because it's not that we're switching from let's say using the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs to something else it's more that we are grabbing in more um, really key discussion points that like you mentioned with the asteroids are very unique situations that may need slightly different um, aspects to their their governance framework while still trying to, at this stage, understand that everything will fall back to the Outer Space Treaty and to the way that decision makers in space are, are doing things through the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space as it stands today. That may not be the future 10, 20, 50 years down the road. We may turn into a specialized agency like the International Telecommunications Union, or we may have to branch off and think about you know, space for Earth and then beyond Earth orbit is a completely different go um, governance structure with maybe its own like spinoff regime. But nonetheless, we are evolving. And I think as it stands right now, all of these things will still be discussed in the same um, like platforms and locations with the similar decision makers. It's just that we're trying to figure out what it's going to look like in the future. And I think that's an exciting part on the politics and, and IR side, because that means that we get to kind of play around with how do we want to shape this for the future? And that brings in that tenet, um, you know, the, the now, I guess, more firmly cemented principle of sustainable development that you see in many different regimes. And we are combating that not only as a space for Earth, so to speak, initiative of helping with socioeconomic issues with space enabled applications, but thinking about what sustainability as a society could mean in space as a whole, if we continue to degrade the earth as we are now, does that mean that the moon and Mars are going to be our best efforts to help combat these issues and kind of make um, you know, humanity a bit, have a, have a bit longer longevity in, in the end? Well, that's, that's one of my big concerns and that's the sort of thing I'm working on most at the moment um, is there's this, this sort of notion that, um, you know, space is gonna sort of save us from the resource crisis that we've got um and you know there's, there's some interest in literature on on sort of uh the phrase i'm i'm using is, is ecological imperialism um and it's sort of this idea of uh they talk about ghost acres and so the, the developed societies um relying on the colonies and and now the underdeveloped nations um to enable us to exceed our resource limits um so like in the 19th century britain ran out was running out of tin uh, so we started mining tin from Malaysia, which enabled our, our tin industry to continue as if nothing was happening. And I see similar sorts of narratives about uh, space resources 
Um, oh, or, 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 you know, we don't need to worry about the fact that we're running out of everything or that we're ecologically destroying the earth because, well, there's all of this stuff in outer space. Um, and and on, on one level, yeah, that might be true. Um, but even so, the solar system resources are still not infinite. Um, and we need to bear that in mind. And so, you know, we're not necessarily, if we don't change our society, if we don't change our economy to be more sustainable and, and think longer term, um, you know, I quite like Kate Rowlett's uh, donut economic concepts, um, which is, you know, partially because it, it's this idea of transforming to a circular economy in which we, we reuse and recycle basically as much as is physically possible to do so. Um, because otherwise we're not solving the problem, we're just delaying it. So instead of our generation fixing the, the resource crunch, we're kicking it down the road 500 years. Um, and the, you know, I don't think that's not responsible or ethical. Um, and so if we're gonna make these massive transformations uh, in order to uh, you know, fix our society, then let's do that. Um, there's, a, there's a quote, there's a couple of quotes actually, this, but um, one is a, French, a 19th century French philosopher, and he was talking about property law. And he was saying like, you know, we live in this great age of technology and, and reason, and people can, can are completely transforming how they understand the universe. Um, and yet they can't conceive that we could possibly change property law. Um, and I sort of feel like the same way, you know, here we are, we're talking about terraforming Mars and hundred year starship projects to send humans to distant stars. Um, but slightly tweaking capitalism so it's not the the ecological disaster that it currently is, is is an unthinkable proposition and that just seems absurd i would i would also say that all of this kind of falls under what i'm calling well i should say i took it from from um reading from peter martinez at secure world foundation because he was the the head of the long-term sustainability guidelines working group and kind of coined this idea of a 3s approach so you have to look at safety security and sustainability together as a nexus that's kind of driving us forward. And, and I think that, you know, on the one hand, if you're talking about, you know, humanity going to space, we should take care of Earth before we start destroying other celestial bodies, in my opinion. However, on the other side, space could be a great driver, data specific speaking, in terms of socioeconomic development and support on Earth. That's why we have so many satellites in low Earth orbit. That's why there's so many different types of stakeholders in low Earth orbit right now, from academia, to governments, to private initiatives, because they all want to try to do something to solve the issues on Earth or to support their initiatives in terms of um, security measures. But I think that that's, that's why I like this idea that if you're looking at making your, you know, where you live safe and secure as well as sustainable, the same should be applied to to, Earth, to low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit could be a, a renewable resource, but as it stands right now with space debris, it is renewable, but it's not infinitely renewable unless we do something about it. So these same tenets that we talk about in the sustainable development goals, talking about having you know, this idea of a safe and secure place for people to do things in the long term is going to have to apply specifically to low Earth orbit down in the future if we want to continue to support Earth initiatives. And the same probably would be said of the geostationary orbit, as well as any kind of orbits around the moon or Mars, as we're seeing now more, you know, more space objects are going that way. We need to keep in mind that maybe we don't mess up those orbits like we have ours already. Let's kind of keep these, these things in mind. And the best two non-binding international law tenets I can think of that really support this are the newly formed long-term sustainability guidelines and then the space debris mitigation guidelines. And I mean, I know that from a legal perspective, they're not binding and they some argue they're not seen as hard law or actually really law at all. But the way that the that our, our regime is evolving, it's taken 10 years to do long-term sustainability guidelines and that's just for some guidelines. I, I, I could see that if we decided to have another treaty or another you know, binding tenet, it could take much longer than that. And technology and science moves so quickly that in space, that's maybe having these guidelines is at least gonna help us form a baseline rather than having nothing at all. Absolutely, and that's that's ultimately why I, um, I you know, I'm sort of a fan of soft law. Um, you know, and again, it's, again, all the things we can we can debate as to whether that's the right term to use or you know, and there are any problems that it, it may or may not have. But I think it's just a practical thing of like, 
you know, trying to get anything produced these days is, is a nightmare. Uh, it takes forever. Um, we're in a field in which things are changing quite rapidly and considerably and constantly having to renegotiate stuff. Um, you know, anyone who's been to Copious knows how slowly it moves, which isn't really a criticism in its sight, it's just the, the nature of, of the process. Um, but you need to take all that stuff into consideration and, and be realistic about what you can actually achieve. And non-binding guidelines that people actually adhere to um, are better than a binding treaty that never actually gets negotiated. Um, and, you know, take your pick as to what instrument you want to point to um, for, you know, oh, well, that doesn't work because it's just been stuck in, in the thing. I mean, I, you know, a perfect example is, is to look over at the disarmament committee who, um, conference on disarmament, who, you know, have talked about a lot of issues for a lot of time, but not a lot happens um, because nobody wants to take that step. Whereas, as we see with space debris mitigation guidelines, sure, there's problems with them, sure, they're not technically enforceable. You know, you can't take anybody to the ICJ for not adhering to them. Um, but when the alternative is nothing, I'd rather have the space debris mitigation guideline. Um, and you know, that sometimes you just have to be pragmatic while still pushing everybody to, we need to do better. Um, I also would say with the space debris mitigation guidelines, we can already see that even the private sector seems to be uh, on board with them and interested in them. There's the newly formed Space Safety Coalition, and they have their own kind of like guidelines with some private actors have come together and said, look, we agree. We want the licensing procedures to be easy for us. We want to be able to go to space. We want to have the same safety um, against space debris as everyone else. So it's actually quite promising that even though they're not really able to deliberate and the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, they have joined the conversation internationally You know, through their own initiatives and are supporting these things. And I think that's that's key. The other thing you mentioned, you know, like having it versus not having it all. I remember that I was thinking if we weren't deliberating these things at, at COPOS, where else would they be happening? I mean, you know, then you might have more fragmented bilateral, multilateral discussions, which, okay, also are happening. But having that firm committee three times a year where they can go and discuss with, what is it, 95 member states now and, and a plethora of um, permanent observ observers, at least they have a platform where they can all come together and all the voices can be equally heard, which right now, given the, the injustices we're seeing in the world, is actually not that bad of an idea. No, I, I completely agree. Um, I just think it's, it's you know, uh, I mean, there's a, and there's other corporations that, that are coming about that I think, you know, showing a positive sign. Natural scale is a big one. Um, you know, they're sort of saying, yes, space debris is a problem, so we're going to solve it. Um, and perhaps somebody actually having some sort of solution is the driver, is the push um, to have stuff happen. I mean, the, the space resources law that came out in the United States came about as a result of these space industries and planetary resources. Um, so now that we've got companies who are actively looking at active debris removal um, as, as their business plan, then they've got a clear incentive to make this a thing. Um, and so hopefully we'll see it. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, and ho hopefully we'll see more corporate pressure as well to sort of say, you know, it would be great if, if more the launch providers were to take a, perhaps a stronger thing. Like if you want to fly on our rocket, you need to have show us that you've got a debris uh, remediation plan or, or whatever. Um, but obviously, you know, it's, it's hard to be the first to do, to do that. Um, and I, I'd appreciate that. Um, but, but I would also say, for example, going back to our idea of how how our the gov space governance is, you know, modernizing and how our regime is evolving, the idea that we're now getting these non-state actors to get involved in the discussion is okay. Maybe not unique because other other sectors or other regimes probably do it better. But at the same time, for the short time that we've been around, that's that's progress for us. That's that's actually, and I think that that goes in hand with. Some, I know we like to criticize and analyze and talk about things, obviously, as like long politics, um, you know, uh, scholars, but at the same time, we've got we've done a lot of things right. We've gotten a lot of things that we've got. We've got a great outer space treaty. We've got these great non-binding um, documents. You know, we've got 
we've got things we're discussing. We're trying to support, you know, um, how can space help with sustainable development goals in general? There are just a lot of different things that are actually moving in a positive direction as long as we continue to move them in a positive direction. And I think that's part of our evolutionary process as well, trying to find what we're doing well and continue pushing those boundaries. And then what's not working, try to find lessons learned from other, um, either other regimes or just by having to, to start at square one, because maybe we haven't found a solution before that could be applicable or useful to how to tackle something in, in space governance. Yeah. And, and that, that's my concern within the sort of the greater international governance sphere is that, you know, we're starting to see signs of breakdown and you know there's some dark clouds on the horizon and no it's not just the current president of the united states although he certainly doesn't help um but you know if and i, I i'm not going to go into i don't really want to go into whether or not we're entering into a new cold war or any of that kind of stuff because you know, there's loads of problems with those terms and we don't have the time or, or expertise to really analyze that but clearly something is happening um <laughs> you know the united states and china are gearing up for some sort of conflab uh problem um the the world the, you know we the world order that, that we've grown up with um you know is is changing breaking you know um, how we you know we've discussed before you know trying to figure out when exactly that happened was it as long ago as 9 11 or or is it is it a more recent phenomenon um but COVID definitely hasn't helped it <laughs> exactly um and you know it's it's like the one the one saving grace is the one great thing about space is it, as it always has been able to kind of ride up over a lot of these problems i mean you can you can look at you know um uh, the, you know the soviet u.s cooperation um and discussions and you know in the in the same year that the, the berlin wall was being put up you know there were the first discussions about you know discussions about things like the international geophysical year and whatnot um same thing with you know we had the whole uh we've got, had the whole U ukraine situation which has basically had no impact on the iss operations um but again just because things have been fine for now doesn't mean that things aren't are going to continue to be fine and if if some of the trajectories that we're seeing go go on you know could that break space governance regime and and what could the consequences be you know especially if we get an american international law and a chinese-led international law or order or regime or whatever you want to call it um and you know with the two corporate i think the one silver lining I pronounce you find in that nightmare scenario is that if anything is going to work in space, there needs to be some sense of cooperation. So there's kind of a massive incentive, but it's still like, yeah, that, that could be a problem. Well, <laughs> and I, I also am thinking that, you know, from a, from a political science or, you know, foreign affairs perspective, space is a very prestigious place. It shows that you have power, you have wealth, you have knowledge, the, all, basically all the resources that you need to do something that predominantly not many countries up until now have been able to do. And so while I'm with you, I don't agree that it's a new space race or a new cold war. I don't like these terms. I think that we were, you know, we're a different generation. We're moving in a, in a different way. Society is, is different than it was at that time. I, I look at it as they're still using, you know, space as an avenue for prestige and, and growth and to showcase the the knowledge that they have in their technological prowess and and for better or for worse whether that's good or bad that that's just how things go from a sovereign perspective it's it's a way to kind of show what they think they'll be capable of in the future and of course it's going to pit states against one another because unless you're actually doing something on a cooperative scale you know like the ISS of course, it's going to look like it's some sort of a race because it's individual states kind of showing their their acumen and their power, and and that's I mean, quite frankly, from a realist perspective, what that what international you know order is about, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. So, while it is, you know, perhaps more of a negative thought, it, it's something that that states feel that they have to do to show that they still have a place in in the international order and and that they can be a part of something and and you know 
actually move forward with the rest of them. Well, and I think we can see how it's changed just in the so, like the target has changed. Now, now that we live in a society where basically everybody can get into space if you want to. Um, I mean, even individual universities are sending things into outer space. Um, the, you know, it's clear that the, competi the competition um, has become about going to Mars or going to the moon um, rather than, than oh, can we put stuff in orbit? Um, and so I, I suppose that's uh, maybe shows a good sign about the thing, but I think it, it's just something to bear in mind. Um, and that, you know, the space stuff happens in a political context. Um, and I think a lot of space enthusiasts can forget that sometimes or deliberately choose to ignore it. Um, <laughs> I think you've got, you've actually got the both going on there. And that's one of the things I think, like with the Artemis Accords, you know, and it, it's great that, that so many uh, in a leadership position in the US are talking about uh wanting international cooperation even with the likes of china um but i think sometimes we need to step back and say you know yeah that sounds great and it wouldn't it be fantastic if the us and china could cooperate on 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 some sort of mar moon base or mission or whatever um but at a time in which we're putting sanctions on china for their huawei 5g infrastructure uh how realistic is it that we're actually going to cooperate with them on say going to the moon um, and I think sometimes, you know, uh, perhaps not the people we work with in the law and policy field, but I think the broader space community sort of does need to have a little bit of skepticism and sort of be like, you know, it'd be great to work with China, but is, is that actually what the US government is proposing? Would they propose that? Can they do that? Um, well, I'd also think if you, if you put these like, yeah, I guess power politics aside, there there are some other big issues that I would hope space could be kind of more modernized about, and that would be in terms of diversity and inclusion, because we have to think about, well, why do we need to go to the moon? Why do we need to go to Mars? Why do we need to mine asteroids? Like, what what is the reason we're going? And if we don't do it in a cooperative or, or collaborative way, and if we don't do it in a way that's diverse and inclusive, and I'm not just talking about gender, but in terms of race, religion, whatever, what are we actually doing it for? I mean, I sometimes think that our, unfortunately our regime forgets that humanity is, is part of the basis of what we're doing anything for and how we're doing things. And I would just like to see, you know, at the same time, we're always really excited when some, a milestone happens in space. But personally, I'm more excited when when I know it's something like that includes a woman or includes someone different than than myself that I can see kind of, OK, we're making progress on these more social issues. And and I personally think that some of these social issues, especially now, you know, in light of what had been happening in the US is just as important as these other power politics, because if we can't straighten out our societal issues then we don't really deserve to go do anything that we're talking about in space, quite frankly. We need to start thinking about it as a total package and not individually thinking. Completely agree. And I think that's that's one of the one of my big pet peeves. Um, you know, with with when we start talking about things, especially, you know, it's things like using we need to go to Mars or or humanity. And it's like, well, you know, do you actually mean humanity or do you mean, you know, what do you mean by we? And, you know, you, yeah, you say we or you say humanity, but the vision of what you describe sounds an awful lot like Midwestern in the United States. Uh, it doesn't sound like a particularly global vision. Um, you know, I know, I remember when, when Jeff Bezos unveiled his uh, vision for the O'Neill Cylinder space colonies. Um, and then one of the things that really struck me by the artwork where they were, you know, I, I was looking at it and I noticed the barns and I thought, you know, that's, that's Midwestern America. That's, that's Ohio. Um, and it, and it was even particularly more stark in terms of you look at Gerald K. O'Neill's original artwork, which wasn't much better. It was still very European, um, in, in kind of outset. Um, but it was a bit more global than, than Bezos's artwork. Um, and I, one of the things that I really saw that struck me by looking at it was like, here I am, uh, a white Englishman who grew up in the United States, and I don't feel that that represents me. Uh, so <laughs> what does everybody else feel uh, about that? And I think that was one of the things that really struck me with Jan Warner's Mars uh, Moon Village idea, mm -hmm. when he was talking about it, and he was sort of saying about, well, you know, what is 
you know, why, why a village? And, you know, it was about welfare, you know, what does a village mean? And it, to Europeans, that's like you know, our idealized community sort of thing. Um, and, you know, there's a, a whole thing, and I, I hopefully will one day write, write a piece on, you know, the utopianism of, of space settlements. But they're very much rooted in a, an agricultural utopia. But everyone who writes it, you know, their idea of an agricultural utopia is very culturally uh, driven. So for American writers, you know, their, their idea of an agricultural utopia is the Homestead Act. Um, I mean, Bob Zubrin even takes this literally. And in, in his, in the case from ours, his vision is individualized domes uh, of a, that will be about two acres of land. So everybody will have their own dome. Uh, <laughs> which is like, okay, that's, yeah. So Americans, so, you know, li literally going homestead, homesteading space. Um, whereas, you know, Europeans, it's again, it's like that rural country village. Um, and then, you know, I don't think anybody's ever bothered to ask uh, the Chinese what, what their vision of, of uh, a, a Martian agricultural utopia would look like. Um, I mean, that was one of the things, I recently read um, Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Moon uh, book, and that was one of the things that he struck me about that um, in his, his depiction of the China dream. Now, there's problems in that because here you've got a white American writing the, the China dream. Um, but it was at least a different depiction of, of, a, of a vision of, of a lunar colony than, than we normally get. Um, and it's like, yeah, you know, the ideal is, is, is going to be different for everybody and we need to recognize that. Well, and also I think because we love, well, at least I know a lot of people love science fiction and we have a lot of science fiction that has become science fact, actually. Um, we need to remember that there is a difference between science fiction and what actually is rea reality and not just from from politics or from science and technology but i think people forget it's very risky and it takes a hell of a lot of money to go to space so anything we do we have to think about again is it worth taxpayer dollars to go do this why are we doing this will we need to do this what happens if that mission fails and i know that that that's kind of like our holding point to kind of keep us grounded and i think that as long as we think about these things that we've just discussed, as well as what does that look like in a governance structure? What kind of non-binding laws do we need? What kind of binding laws do we need? Can they be adapted as we move forward and we learn more? I mean, the one thing is we can only take lessons learned from Earth. Once we get to the moon or Mars on a more, you know, I guess routine basis, if you will, our perceptions will change. I I'm a big proponent of we don't have any local understanding of space. There are a handful of people that have been to the ISS and a handful of people that have been to the moon. And even their local understanding is not the local understanding that we're talking about in these discussions that we're having. We don't have a local understanding even for space situational awareness. We are not the driver in the jet engine or in the car or in the train. It is a satellite by itself. And we're looking at it as a dot on a screen. We need to really start wrapping our head around what can local understanding mean for us in space because we're not physically in that environment and we're not able to be in that environment without a huge amount of science and technology behind us and i don't want people to forget that that with the risk is part of this governance package and we can't just be la -ti da about laws and think that they'll work when there are so many factors that quite frankly are out there trying to kill us because we weren't designed to be there in the first place well, that's, so local that's... understanding is huge that's one of the things that I'm sort of putting on you know, the paper I'm currently writing on on terraforming and science fiction, um, and and I find it interesting that there's this this assumption, there's this vision that you know um, you know all, all the future Martians are going to want to make Mars Earth-like, um, and I mean it's only ever going to be a cheap knockoff of Earth because it's you know I mean. You know, whatever climate, you know, even, even under the most fantastical designs for Mars, the terraformed Mars, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, the Northwest Territories of Canada, you know, is never going to be like California or, you know, any, anything like that. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any consideration that maybe Martians would, will grow to appreciate Mars. Um, you know, it, it certainly happens, you know, you, you, you see that with, uh, you know, European settler societies who, you know, they try to replicate Europe 
in wherever they went. But two or three generations down the line, um, they come to appreciate that no, actually, the deserts of you know New Mexico or, or Central Australia, we like this because it's home. Yeah. And so uh, maybe future Martians will be like, no, actually, we like Mars the way it is. We don't want it to be a discount Earth. Um, we we don't want it to be Mars. And yeah, we're we know that means we we'll have to live in dome settlements for the rest of eternity. But we're okay with that because that's what makes it Mars. Um, on top of the fact, I think that we should go up there with an open mind that, for example, women don't have to be domestic care carers or unpaid workers on top of their paid work. There needs to be more of a equality of how we quote unquote share the load. I mean, maybe Mars could be yeah, in a, in a you know, I guess in a more um, utopian idea, the ideal society because we kind of messed it up here and there on Earth. But at the same time, it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It just means that we need to really consider taking all of our lessons learned and think, what do we really want versus what do we not want to have happen when we get there? And how can a governance framework support that and reflect that and not hinder? Because I know a lot of times, you know, people think regulation is bad, it's a hindrance. Well, regulations are also there to protect and save and, and support. And so if we start looking at it as a positive addition to the scenario and not as a hindrance, then we might be able to get governance to work for us rather than making it think making it feel like it's working against us and i, think I also, it's also think it's, doing that quite well actually absolutely I, I also think it's important to recognize that um i don't want to say people don't change but change isn't something that just happens and so yeah you know a more gender equal society in outer space would be fantastic um, but the simple fact of going to outer space isn't going to make that happen. And we don't need to wait to go, to, you know, for for people to start moving to Mars or space settlements in order for that. If we don't make it happen here on Earth now, it's certainly not going to happen in outer space. That's one of the things that, that frustrates me with the um, uh, post-scarcity uh, discussion sometimes gets brought up with the space resources to bring us back to our initial uh, yeah. <laughs> conversation of you know like a going you know like we don't need to wait to go to space to make a, a fairer more just society if you want a fairer more just society work to make that happen now don't say well one day when once the magical technology arrives mm -hmm. and and you know we've got so much iron from mm -hmm. the asteroid belt that we don't know what to do with it then we'll live in in a star trek in utopia we could do it now um mm -hmm. you know gen you know equal pay is achievable um you know uh, family leave is achievable uh you know all these things they're achievable um it's it's and you know and we have an imperative to do it now you know, it's like you, you, you want to say to, you know, I'm not going to say it to say anybody, well, if you wait long enough, things will improve. So don't worry about it. Because mm -hmm. if, if you're suffering now, that doesn't help you. Um, so it, it's just, it's like the climate change and all, all the other sorts of, you know, oh, we've got to move to Mars to uh, save humanity from the existential threats that are threatening our survival. Um, well, yeah, we do have existential threats, but there are things we can do now to try to prevent those existential threats, rather than start deciding that moving in and out of space is going to solve all the problems. Specifically yeah. Because climate change is, is happening, and we need to do something about it like now, 10 years ago even. Um, and so we may not, we may run out of time. The clock is ticking down. So if you don't want humanity to, you know, go extinct or civilization end, then we, we better get started. <laughs> Well, that's where low Earth orbit is really helpful. Going back to, I guess, my more focus of my research is that I don't think a lot of people realize that low Earth orbit actually does support a lot of these these issues. We have satellites tracking the hurricanes. We have satellites doing supporting disaster management, telemedicine. You know, um, migratory track not only just of animals but, uh, but humanity's movement uh, across borders. Yeah. There are so many things that that space is doing to support Earth, and I think those positives need to be uh, discussed more often to kind of show look we are getting some things right and oh by the way we're doing it within a pretty decent space governance structure does it need to be updated 
Yes, because we've got a lot of things we didn't think about in the 50s and 60s that apply now. Does that mean that we've got to redo it completely? No, it just means that we need to evolve and adapt and add to what we already have existing. Absolutely. One of the reasons why Planet is one of my favorite space companies. Um, <laughs> in fact, I read an article this morning um, and it was, it was talking about the concentration camps uh, in uh, China for the Uyghur population and how they've been able to monitor uh, these human rights violations because they're able to take satellite imagery uh, of the facilities. And I know a similar things of monitoring the refugee camps in Bangladesh and Sudan. Um, that you know, it's you can't put people on the ground or it's dangerous to put people on the ground, but the satellites pro provided uh, uh, the ability for civil society actors to monitor these things and to, to break these stories. Um, and so space is making an impact on on uh, everyday day life. It just sort of wish that there was, um, it was more infused within the community, I suppose is probably my frustration that, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, and I, I, I understand. That. I think you know uh, there there is a uh, the the draw towards utopianism um, is strong. Like that's 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 me. I'm, I want I want a Star Trekian future. That's <laughs> <laughs> sort of where my interest comes from. Um, but I think the other thing is like there isn't going to be a magic solution that suddenly makes everything okay. We need to build that better society. And definitely not unilaterally. Exactly. Um, so I think we've. I mean, we've well gone over what we yeah. said. Was going to be our... <laughs> but what I was thinking is, is that if this turns out to be of interest, we also have our, our blogs and our podcast. And, um, you know, we're happy to do video podcasts as well. And we're always talking about these different things under the tenet of our um, space and sustainability program and our Beyond Earth Orbit program, because now we sort of separate orbits and Earth with relation to space and what happens from the moon onward in space. So... As you can probably guess, I'm tackling the one closer to home while Thomas is going further, further afield. But um, we've got all these these issues that we're tackling, and we're tackling them in a plethora of ways. So this was just our first attempt. I'm glad to see that we can try a different platform and maybe get some kind of a different discussion going. So absolutely, um, and you know, if if you say so if you like our uh, what we've been talking about today or are interested in any of these topics, check out. Our, our website. Uh, we do have a Patreon um, for a, as little as one dollar a month. You can su help support our work. Um, and you know, I mean, it's a situation in which every penny helps. Um, I mean, we we personally don't take anything from uh, money from the organization. E everything that you give to us does go to supporting. You know, paying for the Zoom account that enables us to run <laughs> events like this, or just keeping the website up and running. Um, and so we really do maximize your, the value of your donations. Um, but it, it really makes our lives a lot easier. Um, and, you know, we're just passionate about sort of, we're passionate about space as, as hopefully you've noticed, but, but we also want to shake things up and, and make sure that, um, you know, I think I, I ended one of the papers I wrote by saying, you know, I want to make sure that, that space is, is better for all of humanity and not just a playground for billionaires. Um, and I think that's sort of like the mantra to go for. Let's make sure that it actually is the province of all mankind and not just, well, humankind. It's the tree that says mankind, so it's like, yeah, it's the province of all humankind. Um, and not just, you know, the playgrounds for Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, well, uh, we didn't record all of this because I forgot to hit record, but the 75% of it that I did record will get put up on, on YouTube. Um, so you can watch it again later. At least you had a fireplace for our fireside chat, and it so, was and, to be and fair, we do have a fireplace thirteen for the fireside slash chat. fifty-five so, yeah, degrees. So <laughs> the one <laughs> the Newcastle reflected a fireside chat. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Thank you. All right. Well, we'll try again. Thank you.